Um, Teresa, let me start with you. Uh, you work as the UN and the UN has initiated a reform process towards proved conflict prevention. What were some of the most important steps taken from your point of view within the last two or three years? Teresa, can you unmute? Yes, so I'm, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah. I think it's important to, to cite the reform process that the current Secretary General Antonio Guterres introduced. It dates back and builds on a lot of work that was done um, in the last five years, beginning five years ago with big reviews of peace operations, of how peace building is approach, of women, peace and security, which kind of faced for the first time the, the fact that old models of approach to conflict prevention um, and peacemaking and peacekeeping and peace building a kind of linear sense that first you did one and then you did the other and you moved on and you reached a peace agreement, you did peacekeeping, you did peace building, but those old models that had kind of emerged out of the post um, Cold War years had had got stuck and, and weren't working. So there's been a big process of reassessment building on the reviews of 2015 and a shift, a very important conceptual shift away from a kind of hard division between preventive diplomacy and, and structural prevention and, and a kind of linear sense towards uh, a kind of concept of sustaining peace, which recognizes that we have to be thinking about conflict prevention as we're thinking about peacekeeping and thinking about peace building all the way through and pushes the UN towards a more integral approach. Um, and it's very challenging to put this into practice, but, but this shift is really underlies the reforms um, because it recognizes that we have to uh, take seriously the kind of rhetorical understanding that you don't have peace without development and you don't have peace and development without human rights. And that's very challenging for an organization that's, that's quite siloed in its structure and historically siloed in its behavior. So, so I think that that shift underlines things. And then in concrete terms, there's been some structural reforms to align the way we work at headquarters, which is, is, is good, but, but, but won't work um, and needs to be related, of course, to what's happening in the field. And there, the, the incorporation of thinking about development into the peace and security work and moving into areas like climate security, which you mentioned that Adriana and Adriana has done great work on this, moving into a kind of more structural approach to, to underlying causes and triggers of conflict, as well as the more day-to-day -day kind of preventive diplomacy, mediation, mediation support activities that we're done. At the same time, it's very challenging that, that we all know in the publications you've done and the work of the foundation is that the peace and security environment is ex exceptionally challenging at the moment. And we can talk later, I could go on for hours about the reasons why, why this is the, the case, but I would perhaps highlight two things in particular. One, the internationalized um, nature of many internal conflicts and the regional involvement in conflicts, which makes them contribute to their intractability and their, the difficulty of solving them by, by traditional tools and the difficulty of conflict prevention. And the other, the, the fragmentation of armed groups and different forms of violence. So you have, instead of a kind of binary sense of a government and an insurgency and an opposition in most of the conflict theaters we work, you have an array of different armed groups with different motivations, different funding sources, often tied into regional dynamics, and that, that, that's really complicated. Um, there's one question in the chat, but let me ask you, what are some of the biggest challenges? You mentioned that it is challenging. What are you, which challenges have you already overcome at the UN? And which do you see lying ahead of you with this big transition? Um, I think the UN has, we've got much better at a number of different things um, on, the, on the kind of, we're more nimble in our response. We have, uh, and things like the mediation support work that I oversee has developed very significantly in the last um, 10 years. We have, uh, I think a much more sophisticated sense of uh, integrated analysis. I mean, I have, in my career, I was in the UN in the 90s uh, for five years, and then I was out doing lots of things, including with NGOs and academia and others, and have come back. 
and there's a much more integrated sense of analysis and there's a more profound sense of the UN needing to reach beyond states, needing to engage with civil society, a, a really strong commitment from the top to, to inclusion and a recognition the recognition is there at the core of the sustainable development goals where who's kind of central pledge to leave no one behind the recognition of the importance of inclusion to conflict prevention was there in the un world bank study pathways for peace um and and that that's a very important shift uh and it's not not uncontroversial in some quarter, quarters but the shift towards working at, at sub-state levels and, and seeing all sorts of allies within civil society and work, reaching out to those who are kind of forces for peace and not just forces for conflict is, is, is very key. Um, we've got better at things like our electoral assistance work being conceived with a, a preventive lens often and recognizing instead of elections being the sort of end, happy end point of a peace process as they used to be conceived, we've recognized the flashpoint that elections can represent. And so we, we, the electoral assistance is provided in a way that acknowledges the, the important conflict prevention moment that is. We've got better, as I said, about beginning, it's, it's early work, but the climate security and recognizing we need to change our lens to integrate a climate perspective into our peace and security work and a peace and security perspective into, into the work on climate change. We've got better, uh, still not there yet, at recognizing the, the uh, critical importance of the women, peace and security agenda, integration of women in decision-making all through mediation processes, but, but political processes as well. We've also, and another thing which I think is quite recent, the, the emergence of the youth peace and security agenda and recognizing the value, particularly in many of the countries we work where half the population might be under 25, I'm thinking of Afghanistan, of we yeah. have to engage the youth. All of those things are good. Challenges that this moment, um, and we haven't, we haven't got onto the particularities of COVID-19 right now, but even without that, the very challenging geopolitical environment, um, deep problems in the Security Council, which Germany, of course, is very well aware of, and it's been, been, has been on the council this past year and a half. Um, the regionalization of conflict, so the regional dynamics uh, make the, you can do as good a professional mediation as you can in somewhere like Libya, Yemen, or Syria, but the regional nature of the actors in the conflict are, are hugely challenging. Um, so I'll just, just highlight those ones. We'll get back to some of um, the points, especially the current situation is probably of great interest to a lot of people in the audience. Adriana, um, you've done a lot of work on this UN process. Where do you see the biggest potential for improvement, even though a lot has been done? Uh, first of all, thank you very much to uh, to to Seth and to uh, GIZ for this invitation. It's great to see you guys again. It's good to see Teresa as well again. Uh, and I think the importance of this topic has only expanded given all of the multiple crises that we're going through. With respect to the UN processes specifically, I think we can we try to assess the uh, reforms that are underway and the discursive shifts along four dimensions. First of all, um, in terms of the discursive shift that Teresa was describing, um, and if you will allow me as a civil society member, I can do this. I'm going to assign some grades. The discursive shift that's been led by uh, the Secretary General, in my opinion, gets an A. It's been a very coherent discourse. It addresses the need to tackle the root causes of conflict. He has spoken very uh, wisely about the need for a long-term perspective rather than an emergency response or conflict management approach. Um, he has insisted on this. I mean, it's become a bit of a cliche, but it's absolutely central issue of breaking down the silos because as you know, the UN has institutional inertia, which leads to sometimes excessive uh, division of labor. Uh, the second criteria I think would be the effort to this um, formation of the DPA seems to be a very positive example overall of how 
to break down the silos. Um, but there are other things that need to be done. The building architecture is absolutely key because if you think about it, it embodies the kind of rationale that the Secretary General has tried to promote. Um, it, unfortunately, it was created as a very weak um, uh, body, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity to boost to, for it to assume more functions, including some of those that are currently within the scope of the UN Security Council, which is already completely overloaded. Um, there's also a need to boost, I think, the UN Office for South-South Cooperation. South-South Cooperation at the UN has historically been defined excessively narrowly as technical assistance. But if you look at what happens both within the UN, but also especially outside the UN, there's a tremendous amount of conflict prevention going on that's undertaken by actors as varied as China, as India, Indonesia, Turkey, uh, once upon a time by Brazil, but also smaller states like Timor-Leste and other conflict-affected states that, um, that, that think of innovative ways. So that is not being adequately captured by UN processes, and it also represents an enormous pool of knowledge and resources. We have innovations um, such as the creation of the climate and security mechanism. I see that as a very positive step, uh, especially when, and I think it was last year, there was the realization that this is a very important topic for the Security Council, but it can't just stay there. That could lead to excessive securitization. You need to mainstream it across the UN system so that all of the programs, agencies, funds, etc., adopt a climate sensitive and conflict sensitive approach. And then finally, in terms of the region organizations, we have a very diverse panorama. The AU uh, is way, way uh, in front of Latin America's uh, or region organizations in terms of thinking about conflict prevention, coming up with frameworks, a dedicated architecture. Whereas in Latin America, and I'm picking on my own region because I think it's the most glaring example of lack of regional engagement. Even as there is tremendous potential by the Organization of American States and by other regional bodies. So I would give that a B in terms of the organizational restructuring. There's a lot to go. And no, UN Security Council is not off the table, although the moment perhaps uh, is marked by a lot of fatigue around that topic. In terms of inclusive processes, there's been a lot of progress um, shifting uh, many of the, the processes, including mediation uh, in which uh, Teresa is so involved, from exclusive high table negotiations involving heads of state, diplomats, to more varied arrangements, such as the one that was finally achieved in Colombia after a lot of pressure from civil society. But there's a lot of room to go, not only in terms of youth, but also other social cleavages. What we see happening in the United States right now, of course, entails ethnicity and race, and that's a topic that's politically very charged at the UN, but there's obviously a giant need. And then the final criterion is really political and it has to do with how do you convince member states and the other relevant actors that prevention is not only less costly than a reactive approach, but far more effective. And here there's a lot of recent evidence that can contribute towards that political effort, including the Pathways to Peace to peace a report by the UN and World Bank, um, as well as smaller efforts at Igarapé, we had uh, the Innovation and Conflict Prevention Project to which Uta has already alluded. But I think that's uh, an area where there's also room for improvement. So I'll give that a B. Thank you. Overall, they passed though. <laughs> What are, yeah. uh, what are some of the new challenges that crept up along the way? Because as Teresa said, this process started, you know, five years ago and the world is a different place today than it was then with a lot of the geopolitical challenges that you already sort of touched upon. So Adriana, what are some of the, the aspects that now need to be included in the process much more than in the beginning, like the changing power play among actors within the UN, but also current situations that are evolving. I mean, you mentioned the US, who would have thought that we need you know, conflict prevention on that level in that country, as it seems right now. 
Um, so what are some of the new challenges within the changing world that you see that needs to be addressed? Uh, thank you. That's that's a giant question requiring a giant answer, as Teresa also. Put. I know you were up for it. <laughs> well, let me just point out, I think, uh, three or four key issues. The first one, and I can't help but start with this one, speaking here from Brazil, is the, is the spread of nationalist populism or populist nationalism, I think you call it in English. Um, uh, of course, here in Brazil, where we have an extreme right government whose official discourse uh, says that the UN is a globalist Marxist conspiracy. And even if it's led by many of the generals who are force commanders in UN missions, this kind of discourse immediately seeps down, not only to other levels of government, but to civil society, to the public in general. So this helps to contribute towards a, a, a loss of credibility and legitimacy that needs to be reverted. Um, and of course, there are major shifts going on, perhaps, in the next few months. But for now, certainly in our region, um, this tendency has deeply, deeply affected not only the way that the UN is perceived, but in some areas, its capacity to act in conflict prevention or what we prefer to call it here, which is violence reduction and pre prevention. Then you have another layer, which is geopolitical and geoeconomic. Um, and there is here a lot of alarmism around the role of China uh, within Western media. Um, not so much its role within post-war institutions. The way I see it, China has been expanding gradually, for the most part, its participation across the UN, whether it's UN peacekeeping, mediation, um, or other areas. But most of the alarm comes from the China-led efforts to create parallel institutions, whether it's through the Belt and, Initiative, Belt and Road Initiative or the associated development cooperation institutions that create new pressures um, on the Bretton Woods institutions and the UN system and that are not based necessarily on the same set of norms and values. There's a lot of double um, uh, double standards being applied to China, I should say, because some of the strategies that are being undertaken by China have always been a their global powers. But this creates a level of uncertainty and tension that affects the political processes. And then, of course, we have climate change. Um, what we are going through now, the pandemic, is accelerating a lot of the pre-existing uh, trends, but it also means that we're going to see, we're going to face uh, challenges that are probably a lot bigger than we're, we're going through now. It's very depressing. But what we have to acknowledge, and I, I just wrote a paper for the Global Challenges Foundation in Sweden about this, we are entering the Anthropocene, but our global governance system is still in the Holocene. So we really need to think about the deep logic of global governance in this changing scenario. And let me just finish on a positive note, lest we all uh, become depressed. It's the 75th anniversary of the UN. And I think a few years ago, some of us thought we would be celebrating. It would be a big celebration. No one is in the mood to celebrate. But we do have to identify and commemorate the positive examples and think about how we can promote good practices such as multi-stakeholder arrangements moving forward. And so this can be an occasion to think about the changes that may be implemented in the coming years. Thank you. Um, Teresa, are these some of the discussions that you are having at the UN currently? Some of the issues that um, Adriana addressed? Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, and I, Adriana, at the beginning of her first intervention broke up a little bit when she was talking about peace building, but I, I just wanted to echo and for others who might not have got it, the, the, the shift and one of the reforms was to bring the peace building work more closely aligned with the political department and joining together and that, that's been a, a an, and boost the work of the peace building fund and what that is able to do in the field. So I wanted to echo that. Um, a couple of other points. I mean, one of the, uh, the, the, the long-standing obstacle to doing conflict prevention, and it's related to the, some of the political shifts, as Adriana was mentioning, uh, always around the UN, is concern around sovereignty. 
um, and, and finding the space and willingness and, and trying to shift the discussion um, to conflict prevent, around conflict prevention to, to, to an understanding of it as sovereignty enhancing rather than sovereignty threatening. And a lot of the UN work of the UN in, in the sort of secretariat or mission work in delicate places where there might not be a formal Security Council mandate is working quietly behind the scenes to try and help um, you know, help help national actors, governments and others take steps that will prevent the outbreak of violence or the outbreak of violent conflict, but their concerns around sovereignty and then a kind of short sightedness in terms of the patterns of funding and investment and the, which your slide at the beginning pointed to. And the fact that, you know, success, the old cliches that successful conflict prevention you can't see because the conflict never happened. Um, and, but it's, it's, it remains very, very difficult. And there are a number of, of countries that are, you know, getting them onto, I mean, a lot of what we say around some of those sensitivities is that we're actually working to keep countries off the agenda of the Security Council. It isn't a question of dragging them on. It's more, how can we work early and engage so that a country doesn't erupt into a situation where it will be a threat to international peace and security and to keep it off. In terms of threats, um, a big area where things are shifting really fast and we're all collectively scrabbling to, to, to keep up and understand and respond is the, the kind of um, rapid evolution of digital technology and uh, media, social media, but then this extends right across to, to the kind of broad range of issues, including cyber attacks, the intervention of, of digital technologies in elections. So, so as we can see, um, and in some ways, I mean, in, in many, many ways, it's been a huge global public good and global plus in terms of look at what we're doing today with Zoom or how much we've all learned in the last few months about how to work digitally. Never mind the kind of vast amount of information and education and access and the, the benefits from inclusivity in a broad sense of the emergence of, of and the rapid evolution of technology. At the same time, we also know that you know, we're grappling with hate speech and distortion and all sorts of uh, manipulation of political processes. And that, that, that's a big challenge for, for everybody. And it's, it's new and it's moving very fast. And we're doing, obviously, from within the UN, like everyone else, whether NGOs or government, you, you, you're doing parallel things at the same time. You're both looking at how can we use, use technologies in a positive way and how can we accommodate and respond and, and, and how do we react to kind of the, the violent inducing potential of things like hate speech across the world. Um, so, so I would, would add that um, as, as another point to, to, to the very good list that Adriana uh, put forward. Mm -hmm.